my dear friends on the dais but they are all my very dear friends the award winners anar and satyamurthy i can see many of my friends also among the audience my fr- and all my friends in front of me i'm sorry that i'm speaking in english i should be speaking tamil you know we malayalis understand tamil almost entirely I, i could follow all the speeches that uh, went on here but we find it hard to speak uh, but you will find uh, in the nooli lake uh, uh um and page in tamil pagar pirke my my talk uh, is centered around the question of uh, poetry and resistance let me before that thank the office bearers and the members of the almanam foundation for having me here let me also congratulate the award winners of the day and remember with a lot of joy the deep kinship i have always felt for tamil literature and writers in tamil you said that some of my poems have appeared in tamil and we too in kerala know most of the well known writers in tamil through translations many of them were directly done by senior poets like atur ravi verma some were done through translations i myself even one week back i was translating salma and kutti revathi for a south indian poetry festival that uh, we held in uh, in in trivandrum under my own uh, i mean my own organization did that ayappa panikkar foundation which is very similar to atmanam foundation which keeps doing things related to poetry in particular and literature in general without much ado i will just uh, present my brief not very brief in fact <laughs> uh, talk on resistance in poetry i begin with a quote from cheswami wash who is a very well known polish poet again a nobel prize winner if prizes matter at all he says in a room where people maintain a conspiracy of silence one word of truth sounds like a pistol shot you who have wronged a simple man bursting into laughter at his suffering do not feel safe the poet remembers you may kill him a new one is born deeds and talk will be recorded will there be poetry in bad times asked the german playwright poet bertolt brecht once and replied yes poetry about bad times i would offer a postscript poetry against bad times too that's why i find adorno's statement about the impossibility of poetry after auschwitz the notorious nazi concentration camp no more than an intense expression of anguish we know the nazi concentration camps produced a whole corpus of poetry it has been called holocaust poetry by scores of poets from primo levi and paul salan to abba kovner and nelly sas only there was a coat another polish poet a poetry for the horror stricken for those abandoned to butchery for survivors created out of a remnant of words salvaged words created out of uninteresting words from the great rubbish dump 
James Joyce too was being affirmative when he said of writers, excuse us, we are olives. That is only when you excuse, only in the worst of times, in the most tragic of times, poets give out their best. Like, like olive, when it is pressed, you get the best olive oil. The truth of his statement has been borne out time and again in the traumatic periods of varieties of fascism and totalitarianism of diverse hues. Poets from Paul Salan, Eugenio Montale, Federico García Lorca, Miguel Hernández, Pablo Neruda, Octavio Paz, and César Vallejo, to W.H. Orden, Stephen Spender, Kim Chi Ha, and Anna Ahmatova have responded to the horrors of fascism and state authoritarianism. They were fully aware that silence before fascist onslaught was no less than accusations and collaboration in its, in its monstrous project. Pablo Neruda, in his 1935 manifesto towards an impure poetry, explained his concept of impure poetry thus. I quote him, The used surfaces of things, the wear that hands have given to things, the air, tragic at times, pathetic at others, of such things, all lend a curious attractiveness to reality that we should not underestimate. In 1966, again he said, I have always wanted the hands of people to be seen in my poetry. I have always preferred a poetry where the fingerprints show, a poetry of loam where the water can sing, a poetry of bread where everyone may eat. He dreamt of a poetry that carried the eternal stamp of humanity outside and inside every object, worn by constant use, full of smoke and sweat, food stains and shame, wrinkles, observations, dreams, prophecies, declarations of love and hatred, stupidities and shocks, doubts and denials, affirmations and celebrations, carrying the dust of distances, smelling of lilies and of piss, impure, like a rag, like the body. Octavio Paz defined the poet as a man whose very being becomes, man or woman, I mean, a man as a human being, Octavio Paz defined the poet as a human being whose very being becomes one with his words or her words and hence can make possible a new dialogue. And Miwar said, in a room where people unanimously maintain a conspiracy of silence, as I quoted at the beginning, one word of truth sounds like a pistol shot. How do we distinguish between the concept of Resist, concepts of resistance and revolution. Revolution is a historical event that happens in a specific moment with a specific agenda meant to capture power, though preceded by months or even years of preparation, punctuated by outbursts of popular rage that are often ruthlessly suppressed. It can be creative or it can just be nihilist, a nihilistic upheaval that sends shock waves through the whole of the society and overturns the apparatuses of the state with a blueprint for the future. This blueprint, however, has always been hard to put into practice as its executive agency is human and this agency has many natural weaknesses and failings, the biggest of which is the craze for power. So there is every possibility that a revolution turns into the very opposite of what it conceptually was, as it happened with almost every revolution in history, like the French, the American, the Russian, the Chinese, the Iranian, uh, all, all these revolutions, which were aimed at overthrowing some tyrannical and totalitarian power, but all of which ended up producing dictators and genocides. The violence that followed the revolutions was often much greater than, the committed, than that committed before or during the revolution. The Soviet Union under Stalin being a good example.
France produced a Napoleon. America became an inhuman empire. China had the so-called Cultural Revolution, which turned out to be an attack on the very foundations of culture and free expression. East Europe threw up quite a few wild dictators like Ceausescu and, uh, and Maroja. Cambodia had a mass murderer like Pol Pot. Iran gave birth to a theocrat like Khomeini, for example. These countries that had fought feudal or capitalist hegemonies, oligarchy, theocracy, bureaucracy and autocracy began to mirror their enemies, creating alternative forms of oppression through censorships, proscriptions and labor camps and prisons even for their well-intentioned critics. We were never short of authoritarian rulers, from Franco, Hitler, Mussolini, Idi Amin, Pinochet and Sani Abacha and Ayatollah Khomeini to Saddam Hussein, King Abdullah, George Bush, Donald Trump, Margaret Thatcher, Theresa May, Victor Orban and Narendra Modi. A, a freedom-loving artist can hardly not be haunted by the destinies of artists and poets like these, these were all artists and poets who were killed in the concentration camps, sometimes shot dead, sometimes secretly killed uh, and, uh, and necessarily imprisoned. Osip Mandelstam, Alexander Sorshenistin, Marina Sotayeva, Anna Ahmatova, Bella Ahmadulina, Benjamin Molois, Kensaro Viva, Kim Chiha, Sove, Salman Rushdie, Shamsur Rahman, Taslima Nasreen, Sarod Datta, Chera Bandaraju, Najat Adawni, Valsad El Diu, Adal Labad, I, I have quite a few uh, names, Ai Ching, Beidavo, Ai Weiwei, and, and Lucio. Just to take a few well-known examples, either killed or imprisoned or censored. On the other hand, and we have of course very recent examples in India, on the other hand, resistance is a condition of opposition that is universal and timeless, though expressed within history. It fights all forms of injustice, exploitation, oppression and tyranny unceasingly. Resistance continues even when revolutions turn sour or turn into their opposites. It may stage rebellions even in post-revolutionary societies, like the uprising of the peasants in Ukraine, in USSR or the Tiananmen protest in China and the flower revolutions in East Europe, they are some examples of what I call resistance. There are several other examples, like those we witnessed recently, from Seattle to Egypt, Tunisia, Syria, Yemen, Turkey or Bahrain, the occupation of the Wall Street by young protesters, or of India Gate against the rape of Nurpaya, the many struggles against the nuclear power projects, as in Kudankulam, Yetapur or Peringham, against the cola plant in Plachimada, unscrupulous corporate mining and consequent eviction of Adivasis in Orissa, the movement against the so-called development projects that caused the displacement of the poor and ecological devastation and benefit only the rich like Narmada Dam or Nandigram. The tribal struggles for land like the Chengara struggle and the standing struggle in Kerala. The autonomous struggle of women tea plantation workers in Munnar. The uprising of students and academics in the, uh, in the education institutions in India which uh, you have seen in, from FD, FDII to JNU and DU and HCU, a spontaneous protest by writers and intellectuals as exemplified by the returning of government awards and honors and resignations from the government bodies following instances of extreme intolerance in the country whose most hideous examples are the, mother, are the mothers of intellectuals like Govind Pansare, Narendra Dhabolkar, M.M. Kalburgi and, 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 and more recently Gauri Lankesh and the lynching of uh, Akla Khan or Pahlu Khan in the name of beef, the recent march for science by scientists and lovers of science against the distortions of science like finding science in myths and the many insurrections of Dalits, workers, peasants and women for basic rights and for dignity, all of them radical moments in the ongoing subaltern resistance in India. Moments of what Hart and Negri, critics of the empire, would call moments of biopolitical resistance staged by the multitude. They may not always achieve their ends, but as, John, as Tony Chakar, the Turkish thinker and architect says about the Arab flower uprisings, they show the possibility of another world, as if in a flash through a tear in the sky. Resistance in art cannot be equated with, his, with, the, with this resistance of the people, but it works in relation to it, 
discovering parallel aesthetic and emotional structures and creating new languages of avant-garde writing and art. In one sense, art is essentially oppositional as it works against hegemonic ideologies and status quo structures and ever strives to make it new. But it, comes, but it becomes an instrument of self-awareness for the community, if not an agent of change, when under the pressure of history, it begins to reflect the structures of opposition in real society, in real time, even when it does not necessarily loudly proclaim its intentions. Commitment is also a question of reading and appreciation and, and works not merely at the level of theme or content, but also at that of form, which is forced to radicalize in order to create structures of resistance in the chosen medium. That is why the idea of the avant-garde keeps coming up in the discussion of resistance. We have examples from abroad in the poetry of Louis Aragon, Paul Eluard, Yanis Ritsos, Pablo Neruda, Cesar Vaiho, Raul Surita, quite a few, uh, Nasim Hikmat, or from India, of a Pash, or Faisa Madfais, or Thumil, or Gadar, or whatever Rao. There is too the poetry of resistance from Palestine, like that of Mahmoud Darwish, the poetry of negritude, like that of Senghor or Cesare, the American resistance poetry by Langston Hughes, or the Indian anti-colonial poetry of Nasrul Islam or Subramanya Bharati, contemporary protest poetry in India from different sections oppressed in the name of religion, caste, gender, language, worldview or sexual preference. These poets re-enchant the disenchanted world by turning poetry into a symbolic act intended to transform the world. They persuade the world to look at itself critically and create new structures of imagination and of language, challenging their notions of ethics and aesthetics at the same time. Perhaps Bob Marley's line, get up, stand up, stand up for your rights, or John Lennon's imagine, best to sum up the spirit of the aesthetics of resistance. Aesthetic does not cover up ugly truths. It is a conscious attention, concern and value applied to surfaces, shapes, arrangements, techniques, movements, dynamics, suspensions, densities, repetitions and their expressive powers as opposed to a limited focus only on ideas, content, utility, expediency and practicality. Defense of aesthetics is the defense of imagination, pleasure, sensual and intellectual freedom, curiosity and play, experimentation, openness. Art is not necessarily about harmony and wholeness, but can be an awareness of the opposite, of discord, dissonance, or dissensus, a term that Rak Rancia uses uh, as, as the opposite of consensus. It opposes the capitalist worldview by resisting utilitarian co-option. The shape of a poem, cadences, surprises, sounds, and spaces cannot be commodified nor taken as a, as a booty. Art is anathema to oppressors, as it always generates new ideas, forms, desires, possibilities, energies, and love of existing in the world. Art opposes all forms of regimentation and invests the quotidian with layers of meaning. The autonomy of art that the avant-garde defends is the refusal to compromise with the practice of power and the aestheticization of life in the capitalist world. Avangada art is the inscription of the unresolved contradictions between the aesthetic promise and the realities of oppression in the real world. It breaks down the obvious orders and unsettles traditional patterns in an attempt to redefine the sensible. It resists simple interpretations. It is informed by the products and practices of every day but also differs from them in significant ways. It is difficult to question its meanings as it questions the very process of assigning meanings. The aesthetic regime disrupts the boundaries between uh, and, these, and redistributes the sense created by other practices. Any profane object could get into the realm of artistic experience and any artistic production could become part of the framing of a new collective life. Art interrogates the hierarchical organization of the community 
and creates experiences that disrupt the results of domination in everyday life. Art contributes to resistance by reconfiguring the realm of appearances and reframing the way problems have been posed. It contests the way capacities, voices and roles have been apportioned in the existing order. Artistic practices redefine what can be seen and said and the implicit estimations placed on the members of communities. Art operates upon the aesthetic dimensions of the political as politics itself is a struggle over what can be seen and heard. It denies the rigid identities stamped upon us by the police order and provokes counter histories that would offer new forms of experience and exchange between art and life. I, I have a long discussion on the concept of uh, the avant-garde, which I, which I leave out, which is there in the text. There are arguments in India as to whether modernism in poetry was a mode of resistance or of accusance. Many progressive writers and theorists think that Indian modernism was nothing but a kind of pastiche, a mimicry of the West, a mimetic expression of metaphysical or existential anguish that was exceedingly individualistic or even solipsistic. I would argue that it is unwise to mechanically equate Indian modernism with the Western one, even though Indian modernism was impacted by some Western models at the level of form. But, it, but this can be said of other movements, including the Romantic and the Progressive movements. What was common to the Indian and Western modernisms was that they were responses to modernity, which has been best summed up by Marshall Berman in his famous book, All That Is Solid Melts Into Air. He says, to be modern is to find ourselves in an environment that promises us adventure, power, joy, growth, transformation of ourselves and the world. And at the same time, that threatens to destroy everything we know, everything we are. Modern environments and experiences cut across all boundaries of geography and ethnicity, of class and nationality, of religion and ideology. In this sense, modernity can be said to unite all mankind. But it is a paradoxical unity, a unity of disunity. It pours us all into a maelstrom of perpetual disintegration and renewal, of struggle and contradiction, of ambiguity and anguish. To be modern is to be part of a universe in which, as Karl Marx had said, all that is solid melts into air. In India, modernism in poetry was preceded by what can be called a pre-modern or post-romantic transitional phase that foreshadowed the new poetics represented by the work of Nirala of Hindi, Jivananda Das in Bengali, M. Govindan in Malayalam, Bharati Dasan in Tamil, and similar authors in other languages. Indian modernism certainly had in it elements of resistance against the modern urban infernos, the alienation, the commodification of everything by capitalism, the new Maidas that turned everything it touched into a commodity, uh, the careerism, the depletion of basic human values, and a competitive ethos promoted by the market that one may find also in poets like T.S. Eliot in English or Baudelaire in French. However, modernism in India had also its specific national and regional context. One was the partition of India that the Bengali poet Anandha Shankar termed an elemental psychic experience and Vishnu Dev, another major poet called Life in Death or Death in Life. And I have quoted several other poets uh, uh, who have, have commented on partition. This disillusionment produced by partition and the kind of independence we got can be detected in several poets from Makdu Mohideen of Urdu to Samarendra from Manipuri. Muktibot's sense of enveloping doom, a gay sense of island-like solitude and the melancholy one may find in the first generation modern poets across languages like Abdurrahman Rahi, Harbhajan Singh, Navukant Barua, Sachi Rautroy in the north or Gobal Krishna Adiga, Sundar Ramaswamy, Sri Sri and Ayyapa Panikar from the south are not entirely ahistorical, as some critics seem to presume. The loss of Gandhian values like honesty and austerity in public life, continuing exploitation and discrimination, depletion of rural life, huge demographic, demographic movements prompted by unemployment, marginalization of huge sections of underprivileged people, who had passionately taken part in the freedom struggle and suffered numerous losses, 
the careerism, greed and selfishness of the rising middle classes, the intrusion of the market and its materialist ethos in everyday life, all these must have forced the dark images one comes across in modern poetry. Like the Hindi poet uh, G.M. Muktibodh who says, the face of the moon is crooked. And Kedarnar Singh, another major Hindi poet, speaks of Anagad, the one who has not yet come, whose wings are lost in the golden shadows and feet trembling in the mist. So there was a kind of catastrophic, tragic vision in a lot of poets who wrote in the late 1950s, uh, 1950s and early 1960s. So there was disillusionment. And to express this disillusionment, they used various uh, techniques and modes like uh, black humor, uh, irony, sarcasm, structural discontinuity, uh, images which were often discontinuous, uh, and new, new kinds of uh, metaphors. So there was a large segment of it, but even then, there was a large segment of Indian reality that the high modernism, I mean the modern, early modernism of the 1960s, could not accommodate in its aesthetic matrix. And it is perhaps natural, we find very few Dalits or women among the first generation modernists. Yet its cry, art for art's sake, had the same significance it had when it was first raised by Flaubert in the 1860s, when he was accused of being a democrat. It really meant a refusal to use art to serve the interests of the state, of capital, of bureaucracy, or of the market. An assertion of the autonomy of art as an expression of freedom and an act of resistance uh, to all forms of expression. Oppression. The modernists of the West, like Kafka, Beckett, Ionesco, Eliot, or Auden, had exposed the hollowness of the emerging capitalist society through powerful images, metaphors, and characters in works like The Wasteland or um, Ionesco's Rhinoceros, which is so relevant to today's India, Metamorphosis, Waiting for Godot, or The Unknown Citizen. Modernism in literature was actually a rejection of the monstrosities of modernity, its alienating consequences, and its diminution of man, though this rejection of decadence was sadly interpreted as decadence by the progressives. True, the modernists in India too did not offer any easy solutions and utopias. Their very vision was dystopian and they were fundamentally skeptics who doubted all ideologies. The primary task that they set them to themselves was make, making it new, in the words of Pound, discovering a new idiom to express the complexities of modern life. And they did this by breaking canons, creating new forms, tones, structures, textures, and giving birth to a new poetics free from the confines of the status quo. They thought it was better to sacrifice the conservative concept of poetry for the newly revealed realities of life than to sacrifice those realities in order to preserve the conservative concept of poetry. Tradition began to be understood in a new way. And uh, here I discuss also an expression by U. R. Anandamurthy. Uh, uh, he used the word, uh, he along with Nagaraj, uh, um, in, a, in the introduction to an anthology of modern poetry called Vipava, he used the word Tagore syndrome. Uh, he's, uh, because Tagore represented uh, cultural nationalism, romantic love, faith in the divine, and faith in progress. And the modernist poets were questioning all these. And, and so, and uh, he comes to say uh, that modernism began in every language with uh, what can be called an act of patricide. Uh, patricide literally means killing the father. So there were Tagores in almost all the Indian languages and it, it is by questioning them, questioning their uh, very facile optimism and questioning their, uh, you know, the, the, their various kinds of faith, especially in uh, cultural nationalism, for example, that these poets uh, uh, came up and they, uh, and, and they produced a series of uh, um, masterpieces, uh, modern masterpieces like uh, Gopal Krishnadiga's Bhumi Gide, or Mukti Bodh's uh, Antherame, which means in the da in darkness, Sri Kantavarma's Magad, Ayyapapanikir's Gotrayanam, Sridham Shiyashtanta's Jatayu, all of which critique the dehumanization and downward evolution of man in our time. Modernism certainly was an aesthetic necessity, as it brought about a much needed revolution in the way poetry was conceived, written and appreciated in India till the 1950s. But it was ultimately also a middle class phenomenon, and it had all the limitations of such a movement. 
Here I would go back to Peter, Peter Berger who opines that the real avant-garde not only changes the idiom of art but interrogates the very institution of literature. It expresses not just a disillusionment with the existing society but rebels against it and wants to reshape it. The difference between uh, the two kinds of avant-garde, the, the modernist avant-garde and what came later, uh, the, the earlier one, modernism, that focuses only on transforming language and the, and, and the second one that tries to transform the society can be illustrated with the names of a few well-known writers from abroad or, or uh, many other writers from India. I have, I have made a long list of writers which I am not going through. Since the 1970s, following the weakening of the esoteric or high modernism, we find the latter kind of a new avant-garde emerging in Indian poetry. Your Anandamurthy has called this flowering of the backyard. These are poets who are chronologically speaking postmodernists, though not theoretically so in the Western sense, who have lost their halo to recall a poem by Baudelaire where a poet loses his halo on the street and refuses to pick it up as now he is a man among men and can see the realities of life as they are instead of watching only the rainbows and drinking divine honey. This new avant-garde is by no means monolithic as they include women poets who are fighting patriarchy by creating an idiom of desire often organized around the body, a new kind of mother tongue, Dalit poets now being mainstreamed at least in 10 Indian languages who question the divisive system of caste and its disastrous consequences that impede the creation of an egalitarian society or, uh, uh, who, who also follow Ambedkar to a great extent. Adivasi poets who celebrate the community values of tribal life, articulate their century-old agony of exile and restore to history their forgotten heroes. The poetry of political descenders of diverse hues from Gandhians to Maoists. The poetry of torment and indignation by writers caught between the violence of the state and the militants from, and the militants from besieged locations like Kashmir and the extreme northeast. And the green poetry by those who are uneasy about ecological havoc going on in the name of development that benefits only a few and render innumerable poor people homeless to name some of the main strands. This leads us straight to the question, what is to be resisted in India today? I, I'll end with that. In one, in one word, I would say violence. It is impossible for the genuine writer today to ignore the violence that threatens to drown our beautiful world. Blood floods our bedrooms and our drawing rooms are strewn with corpses. And that is often the blood and corpses of those who have neither drawing rooms nor bedrooms. Even the ivory towers of pure aesthetes are being swept by the winds of violence and change. Poets can no more be comfortable with ahistoricity, even if they transmute it into apocalyptic visions. Poetry is an act against violence, and violence takes different forms today. Imperialist, capitalist, communal, casteist, patriarchal, technofascist, ecofascist, and several others. Both the are so globalization, the practice of the empire, are the greatest violence of our time as it induces monoacculturation jargonization and death of languages and cultural amnesia and brings new hierarchies into being through its monologue of power. A capitalist market with its exploitative practices that marginalize the masses and its culture industry that intrudes into every realm of culture and turns even art into a commodity is another embodiment of violence. Patriarchal violence is not to be reduced into physical violation alone. It tries to shape our worldviews and our language and creates its exclusive canons in art and literature. This is equally true of casteism that divides the world in order to perpetuate its hierarchy and its power and aspires to keep the so-called lower caste people in eternal slavery. Technofascism misuses science to perpetuate class and destroy the environment through an idea of development that benefits only the, only the upper classes and castes. It embodies the tyranny of the rational, leaves out everything that cannot be counted or measured and, and digitized as inauthentic and believes in what Milan Kundera would call the ecstasy of technology, free from every moral concern. Another major and visible threat to culture and life today 
is communal violence, of which we have seen some rabid outbursts in India recently. This happens when religion, actually Pavanan had referred to this, two ideas of religion, two aspects of religion. This happens when religion gets divorced entirely from ethics, from God if you want, gets congealed into dogma and fanaticism, and begins to create a scapegoat and other in its own image, held responsible for every suffering that one endures. So that means it is religion without spirituality. Communalism is actually religion minus its essential spirituality. It shows patriarchal proclivities, manufactures an artificial tradition and a distorted history, dismissing elements that do not suit its design and uses racial symbols and archetypes to appeal to the popular unconscious. Thus, it, it is also a form of cultural and historical violence. This communalism shares with fascism its basic features, what Umberto Eco calls poor fascism or universal fascism in his book Five Moral Pieces. A fascism that sees dissent as betrayal, defines nation negatively to the exclusion of minorities, thus promoting xenophobia, fears difference, advocates action for the sake of action, rejects modernism, looks at pacifism as collusion with the enemy, scorns the weak, appeals to the middle classes, encourages the cult of death, upholds machismo, I mean a kind of masculinity as a value and opposes all non-conformist sexual behavior, treats people as a monolith, derides parliamentary governments, promotes what George Orwell would call newspeak, that sees everything as black and white and avoids any kind of intellectual complexity, limits the tools available to critical thinking and creates a cult of tradition taking truth to be already known. They replace argument with physical attack and annihilation. We have seen this fascist tendency at work in the interventions of the central government in academic and cultural institutions, blatantly turning them into ideological instruments while also downgrading them in terms of quality or in the many attacks of and the imposition of forms of censorship on why even models of artists, thinkers and writers. Genuine poetry, I conclude, genuine poetry has always opposed violence in its direct and oblique, tangible as well as intangible forms and more than ever it needs today to raise its profoundly human voice against all forms of violence. Pass had foreseen, Octavia Pass had foreseen the contemporary situation. I quote him, Reality has cast aside all disguises and contemporary society is seen for what it is, a heterogeneous collection of things homogenized by the whip or by propaganda, directed by groups distinguishable from one another only by their degree of brutality. The different groups and, how, and we can distinguish them only by the degree of cruelty. All of them are equally brutal. In a recent essay, The Poetic Torture House of Language, the Slovenian thinker Slavoj Zizek points out that even poetry is not always free from hatred. He examines how the aggressive nationalistic feeling promoted by poets, he gives an example of Radovan Karadic, a Yugoslavian poet, who was also an army general, contributed to the genocide in Yugoslavia. He also takes the names of Peter Hanke from Austria and Hassan Engis from Rwanda as promoters of racism. We know there were some poets who supposed, supported fascist ideology or totalitarian trends uh, in, in the countries where they flourished. Walter Benjamin saw language as a medium of peace and dialogue. But Sisek asked this question, what if the same language is what gives man the violent energy like that of the beast? Hegel in the Phenomenology of the Spirit says that poetry is a silent, ceaseless weaving of the spirit. If so, the poets can also silently create a consciousness of jingoistic hatred that we notice only when explosions of violence happen. Or if language is the house of being, as Heidegger says, its nature depends on the being that inhabits it. If that being is inhuman, that house can become a torture house. Such a dehumanization of language happened in Hitler's Germany, Mussolini's Italy or Franco's Spain where language was used to tell lies, where missing meant murdered, and resigned meant dismissed from job. Transitive verbs became intransitive, and passive voice became more common in order to avoid naming the perpetrators of crime.
and i fear it is increasingly happening in india where the media including social media are used to spread untruth statistics is used, used to to sell lies surveillance process for security patriots some means join in the chorus of the hegemonic hate mongers and independent opinion becomes sedition this context may force us to radically reread some of our own so called patriotic poets when language is inhabited by beasts we may have to torment language make it strange distort cut and realign it in order to exorcise it of untruth and make it tell the truth poetry always try to say what it cannot say and its power comes from its willingness to give a voice to what is voice, voiceless and a name to what is nameless it advances on the blank page poetry becomes important not even not, not when it reproduces established values given truths and ready made slogans it's an uh, it is an ear that hears beyond the understanding of common sociology and i that sees beyond the color spectrum of everyday politics it promotes self awareness through a criticism of the existing society of the status quo and the cultural and material violence it perpetrates it is the undeclared mission of poetry today to retrieve the past without being atavistic to disentangle the effects of power from representation to reestablish the almost lost connections between man and nature to redefine the boundaries between the self and the other and the self and nature in the context of man's species arrogance that cripples the environment as well as his own or her own moral and spiritual life to resensitize man to suffering alienation and solitude and to give positive non violence and love which is its greatest expression the central place it ought to have in all human discourse uh, i yeah let me let me conclude with two quotes one from octavio paz himself we must find the lost word dream inwardly and outwardly decipher the night tattooing and look face to face at the noon day and tear off the mask so so that we can finally say i am history a memory inventing itself i am never alone i speak with you always you speak with me always i move in the dark i plant i plant signs so there is uh, so the so there is a moment of ap- apocalypse in poetry which may not be construed as a moment of ignorance or unconsciousness but of intense awareness filled with a deep concern for all living things that the buddha the great pioneer of the philosophy of non violence would have qualified as karuna or compassion poetry is the entry of the nameless into truth poetry is the entry of the nameless into truth thank you